take it away, Zoltan. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, I hope uh, you can see my screen. Yeah, that's perfect, Zoltan. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I, I could have uh, just uh, given a subtitle that uh, the world of acronyms. Unfortunately, ambient uh, mass spectrometry is uh, uh, infamous about everyone uh, coming up with a new acronym for any little uh, technical improvement or an old technique. But yeah, that's. Um, that, that's where we are. At least uh, I, in this case, I used a, uh, a word which uh, uh, has been used for hundreds of years, uh, at least for a French city, where um, actually quite good champagne is produced. Anyway, so um, trying to go forward. Okay, so. Um, Reams and uh, actually a number of these techniques uh, I will be talking about in course of the next uh, 40 minutes is uh, it belongs to the world of ambient mass spectrometry and uh, I put this slide in just to give you uh, some flavor of uh, what we mean by ambient mass spectrometry. So uh, ambient means ambient in a way that uh, we don't modify or sample. So uh, if you can see my uh, unmodified uh, finger also on the camera, it still looks the same. Um, so uh, we can actually put biological samples on front of the mass spectrometer, or we can actually take the uh, mass spectrometer uh, to the uh, sample. And more importantly, uh, we can um, detect uh, meaningful uh, species uh, using these approaches. So because uh, yeah, one can obviously put uh, any kind of sample on front of the mass spectrometer, but uh, the I would say the uh, the big uh, breakthrough was when uh, we actually started getting uh, information which we could actually uh, use, for instance, for uh, medical diagnostics, uh, toxicology, uh, surgery, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, when it comes to in vivo mass spectrometry, um, it actually, uh, it, it was the concept uh, was coming from the uh, DESI story. So in the early days of ambient mass spectrometry, uh, we had a big hammer and uh, we were actually trying to find uh, the nails uh, for it. And uh, using mass spectrometry to identify uh, tissues in course of surgical interventions was uh, one of these potential nails. Because uh, as some of you may know, uh, when uh, surgeons are uh, operating uh, on patients, especially on cancer patients, so what they use to find a tumor is uh, the preoperative imaging and during the, uh, the surgery, they may keep an eye on the preoperative imaging, but mostly they are using actually not their eyes, but much more their thumb. So really the, the tactile information is the most important uh, way of uh, trying to find out where the tumor is. And uh, it is uh, as unreliable uh, as it uh, sounds. So. Uh, Identifying tissues in corporal surgical interventions has been a problem. I think actually the, the first paper I found uh, on this topic was uh, uh, from the early 20th century, so well over uh, 100 years ago. Anyway, so uh, to make the, uh, the long story short, uh, the solution, the first solution for in vivo mass spectrometry, uh, which we came up with uh, was uh, using uh, standard surgical energy devices, so surgical diathermy as an ion source. It turned out that uh, actually almost all surgical energy devices, for instance, surgical diathermy has been used since the 1920s and uh, surgeons have been ionizing a tissue structural lipid content uh, but these ions were just blown away uh, in the operating theater, nobody cared about them. So uh, the only thing we had to do is uh, take an instrument uh, to the operating theater, uh, collect the phospholipid ions and uh, introduce it into a mass spectrometer and get uh, almost real time tissue identification. So uh, it actually needed a little bit of uh, a few uh, technical uh, improvements because uh, or first instrumental setups uh, were functional for like 20 seconds. And then uh, we had to clean them uh, for several days until uh, they become operational again. Um, using uh, this kind of uh, setup, which the video shows, 
one can actually use an instrument for a week without uh, any maintenance. So this actually takes care of fragmenting the clusters and also keeping uh, all the muck out of the uh, instrument. And using time of flight analysis, we can get uh, tissue specific uh, structural lipid fingerprints uh, with as short as 0.2 second uh, delay compared to the actual uh, surgical procedure. So um, this is uh, the actual uh, CAD drawing of the, uh, of the RIMS uh, atmospheric interface. Funnily enough, that's the uh, important bit here, because at the surgical end, it's almost standard uh, surgical handpiece. The only difference is that uh, we are aspirating the uh, surgical aerosol. So how it works is that uh, we have a Venturi air jet pump uh, on the top, and uh, this actually aspirates the aerosol particles. We are fusing the aerosol particles with a, we call it matrix, because actually it has a very similar role as the Maldi matrix, but this is an organic solvent, mostly isopropanol. So we are diluting these aerosol particles with isopropanol. And actually, we are diluting them to, uh, to be able to work in the dynamic range uh, of the analytical technique and uh, also to introduce uh, calibrants um, uh, into the uh, experiment. And then these diluted uh, droplets uh, enter uh, into the vacuum, get accelerated by the uh, free jet, and eventually get uh, impacted uh, on a Hot surface, so this is heated up to seven eight hundred centigrades, and on this event happens the uh, the rapid evaporation and uh, the actual ion formation. So, um, so this is how it works. This is actually a completely new atmospheric interface concept, uh, which, uh, as it turns out, uh, we can use uh, for the analysis of any kind of uh, aerosols, especially uh, biological aerosols. Uh, having a high uh, lipid content. So we, we tested this uh, technology in uh, different uh, types of surgeries. Uh, we did a uh, quite a big uh, clinical feasibility study and uh, we could get a 90, 90 to 100% accuracy. So uh, uh, um, back then it was uh, like 0 0.7 to 0 0.3 uh, second uh, delay time. But uh, if you compare it to, to frozen section histology, which, which takes half an hour, 40 minutes, or actually uh, in case of uh, Giant Cross Hospital neurosurgery, uh, they are taking the sample over to UCL uh, for uh, interoperative uh, assessment. Uh, it may take uh, up to two hours until the result comes back. So uh, working around a few seconds uh, is uh, certainly uh, much, much better. So the technology approach is, is not, as I said, it, it's not limited to diathermy. So we can actually combine practically any kind of surgical device uh, which would produce uh, aerosols and actually most of the energy devices uh, produce aerosols. So this is uh, what's also called uh, surgical smoke. So uh, when uh, one enters the uh, surgical theater, then um, usually uh, there is this uh, smell of uh, burnt flash, because actually it is burnt flash, because the energy devices, most of them are actually uh, thermally uh, degrade, thermally ablate uh, the tissues. Not necessarily the Cavitron uh, ultrasonic surgical aspirator, but uh, for instance, uh, if we move one step further and uh, look at surgical lasers, uh, they uh, actually uh, do the same. And the surgical lasers actually uh, had an um, interesting uh, career uh, in this uh, little world, because uh, in the previous talk, I was talking about uh, LDI, so laser absorption ionization, so doing MALDI without uh, matrix. And it turned out that if we are using this REMS atmospheric interface for a laser ablation aerosol, then uh, it works uh, pretty well, and uh, one can actually produce uh, uh, quite nice um, images, as you can see it on the uh, left side uh, of this uh, uh, slide. Uh, so uh, this is, these are mouse brain um, uh, sections. So, uh, and uh, the 
interesting thing is that uh, this way we can actually collect uh, much, much more um, uh, rims like, so electrosurgery rims like data, which if we really want to use a statistical model and we want to have a big uh, spectral library, then it's a way, way more uh, productive way of uh, collecting a large amount of spectra. So in the brackets, you can actually see uh, how one can collect uh, training data uh, for electrosurgery using electrosurgery. So there is a little tissue sample here and there are the burn marks and then there is the map of the burn marks uh, in uh, somebody's lab notebook and then there are these H and D sections which uh, we are taking to histopathology uh, consultants and asking them what is their best guess what used to be um, in these uh, big gaps and then uh, yeah uh, usually uh, they are quite unhappy to answer such questions in contrast, if you are using a laser, then uh, we can uh, easily do an imaging on a section and do histology uh, on the uh, on the next uh, the neighboring section and can get uh, perfectly histologically annotated uh, the data sets. So uh, from a average uh, surgical tissue sample, we can get millions of histologically annotated spectra. What's very interesting, as I already alluded to, is uh, that uh, the carbon dioxide laser and the surgical diathermy, so electrosurgery, they are actually using, uh, they are using the same spectrum. So uh, uh, you can see it, so uh, adipose eye knife, uh, it refers to standard electrosurgery and adipose laser is uh, the carbon dioxide uh, laser. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's a nice, clean uh, triglyceride uh, signal from adipose tissue. It's not that surprising. And for, from the tumor, we see uh, much, much more um, structural phospholipids. And a few other things as well, but uh, those are the, uh, the main species uh, detected um, in the spectra. And also in case of the PCA plot, you can see that they are nicely uh, mixing the um, and the separation is based on the tissue type and not uh, on not based on the uh, actual ablation modality. What was really interesting is when we actually created a statistical model uh, using uh, laser ablation data and then used it uh, for in vivo surgical intervention using the um, electrosurgery because unfortunately surgical lasers are not used uh, too often uh, in uh, theater these days, but uh, electrosurgery is, and the spectra actually allows uh, the interchange of the uh, modalities. And if you can see, if you can look at this uh, confusion matrix on the right side, it looks like that uh, we can uh, identify um, tumors uh, pretty accurately and uh, healthy tissue uh, even better. So we started using carbon dioxide laser and not only us, but uh, a number of um, other groups uh, around the globe, um, especially um, Isabel Fournier's uh, group um, and um, also uh, uh, Dwayne Miller's, uh, Arash's group at the University of Toronto um, and so on. And uh, quickly uh, in, in a parallel fashion, everybody realized that uh, if we want to get better sensitivity and uh, better analytical sensitivity, then it just uh, makes perfect sense to not to use carbon dioxide laser, but to use a laser at uh, 2.94 uh, micrometer, which is the uh, OH uh, stretch frequency. So it's a resonant laser, which uh, very, very qualitatively what it does, uh, it, it just uh, uh, decouples the uh, hydrogen bonding uh, in the tissue uh, with uh, minimal energy randomization. So we're not heating up the tissue that much, but uh, practically just destroying all the hydrogen bonding. And uh, at much, much lower temperature, we can dissolve biological uh, species. So this is an OPPO uh, laser setup, and uh, this is actually they are just uh, some images uh, obtained uh, with the uh, OPPO laser from uh, fresh frozen uh, tissue. So one can actually do the imaging uh, the, uh, the same way. 
the, the punchline is that um, the OPPO laser actually uh, works with FFP uh, sections. I showed DESI data in the previous talk for FFP sections, but uh, the OPPO laser works uh, much, much better uh, without any kind of uh, sample prep. For the DESI, we had to uh, deparaffinize it and uh, do the DESI experiment and deparaffinization is still a serious uh, step. Uh, it's a protocol, one has to go through it uh, and so on and so forth. Um, interestingly enough, um, the OPPO laser actually works without deparaffinizing uh, the tissues. Actually, it even works without sectioning. So one can take an FFP block and do the imaging uh, on the uh, surface of this block. So um, without sectioning, without doing uh, really anything and uh, get a pretty good uh, spectra with certain lipid species uh, conserved. So uh, I'm not saying that it is the same uh, spectral information what you would get uh, for fresh frozen, but uh, for instance, uh, PIs, uh, um, survive pretty well uh, in the tissue. Practically any kind of lipid which has a large uh, hydrophilic uh, bit, which it is probably using uh, um, to anchor uh, to structural proteins, can uh, stay in the tissue and still stay at the uh, right place. So there is no uh, lateral diffusion. We can get, as you can see from these uh, images, we can get histologically uh, um, well defined uh, images and uh, yeah it was done back then at 250 micron uh, now we are actually getting down uh, to 20 40 microns so going back to the surgical theater so this is uh, Charing Cross Hospital London and there is a funny uh, mass spectrometer you can see it actually has uh, seven wheels uh, which is uh, rather unusual for a mass spectrometer it also has uh, on the back side, uh, one can see, it also has brakes uh, on it. Uh, the instrument uh, weighs uh, 460 uh, kilos. It's a Zevo G2 access uh, QTOF uh, with some additional bits uh, in the box. So if it doesn't have a brake, then um, it can go through walls uh, very easily. So, uh, and uh, yeah, learning from uh, this experience, uh, we actually have equipped it uh, um, and um, the instrument is moving into the theater and moving out of the theater after the intervention, ideally uh, pumping down uh, in an hour or so. And uh, this video actually shows uh, how the intervention goes in breast surgery at the uh, Charing Cross Hospital. So you can see uh, the quasi uh, real time spectra on the screen and uh, can also see the uh, identification screen. I mean, it, it's very easy to, uh, to to interpret. I mean, there is this huge uh, triglyceride signal uh, coming and, uh, and going as long as uh, the surgeon is working in the uh, adipose tissue. And the data we are getting uh, out of these interventions is uh, actually um, a chemical trace of the, uh, or biochemical trace uh, of the surgical intervention, um, which can actually be translated to uh, histology, and one can even use it as a quality control for the uh, surgical intervention. And we can actually go back and, uh, and check what was happening uh, at a certain time, what kind of uh, tissue uh, was uh, uh, dissected uh, with using what kind of surgical modality. And again, uh, this is pure uh, structural lipid uh, spectrum. Even the uh, fatty acid signals uh, are actually coming from uh, the fragmentation of the uh, structural lipid. We actually uh, not only us, but uh, a number of people um, uh, looked at uh, the RIMS technology after it got commercialized. Uh, as, uh, as a potential analytical tool to be used for uh, other purposes, not for surgery, but uh, for practically um, anything else, analyzing other uh, biological uh, specimens. And one of the early applications uh, was uh, identification of bacteria. So um, in that case, the tool which was used is a pair of uh, bipolar forceps for those who are familiar with the 
surgery know that uh, this is an electrosurgical tool mostly uh, used in uh, neurosurgery for um, high precision uh, work uh, and stopping uh, minor uh, bleeding. So uh, it has two electrodes in the form of forceps and uh, one can actually generate a, a, an RF uh, a potential in between. So if one grabs uh, any kind of biological material uh, with the tips of the uh, forceps and uh, deploys the, uh, the power, then uh, it gets quickly evaporated. And since it has a washing line, we can use this uh, washing line off label and aspirate the, uh, the smoke, the aerosol uh, through this uh, washing line and introduce it into a mass spectrometer. So uh, I always say that this is the, uh, the most versatile ambient ionization tool. One can really ionize anything and everything as long as it is electrically condu conductive. So um, when uh, we first built this setup, then uh, uh, people were always coming in uh, with uh, any kind of food items, uh, uh, with the leaves of the indoor plants uh, in front of the uh, hallway, uh, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, one can really do uh, any kind of uh, sample analysis uh, using this. It is invasive, so uh, sampling uh, colleagues' uh, earlobe is uh, not uh, anything uh, friendly but uh, you can actually get a signal. So um, these are bacterial uh, spectra. So these are clinical isolates uh, from uh, the NHS lab uh, at uh, Charing Cross Hospital. And uh, yeah, these are all uh, bacterial uh, lipid fingerprints, practically from uh, different uh, pathogens. And one can actually get uh, much better accuracy uh, than uh, with the uh, MALDI method, which in turn is uh, looking at uh, um, ribosomal protein signals. And we can actually do such applications uh, using this approach, which uh, the MALDI method uh, cannot do. So for instance, strain level identification of uh, uh, bacteria or looking at yeast without um, any kind of uh, sample preparation. One can also use the same technology for uh, cell analysis. So uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, cell samples uh, using this uh, technique uh, for a number of years. Um, cell pellets, um, again, without any kind of uh, sample prep. One can actually even look at cells using the laser approach. One can even look at uh, uh, confluent layers of cells uh, without uh, the sample prep. And uh, one can actually, uh, we looked at the NCI60 panel and uh, it actually shows a nice uh, grouping uh, with regard to uh, histological origin. Also uh, using the same uh, technology, uh, our colleagues at the uh, Institute of Cancer Research uh, did a large study uh, looking at various uh, human uh, breast cancer cell lines uh, and uh, using this as a shotgun lipidomics tool, uh, discovered um, a new subtype of uh, breast cancer driven by uh, PIK3 LCA mutations. And this is the uh, automated uh, version uh, of the uh, system. So uh, this is a uh, this is a Takan uh, Evo uh, robot uh, with a side robotics uh, add-on and it is actually using the uh, carbon dioxide laser and it's fully automated so you can put there uh, cell cultures, uh, bacterial cultures, biological fluids uh, and so on and it does all the analysis uh, on its own without any uh, human intervention in case of bacterial colonies it even finds the bacterial colonies on the agar plate and yeah, this is the uh, RIMS interface. And uh, one can actually uh, do automated analysis uh, this way. And uh, at the end, uh, I thought I uh, also uh, talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the combined uh, applications when we are actually using the in-situ techniques uh, for combination of uh, in-situ techniques with uh, imaging to uh, for instance, identify bacterial cells uh, in uh, human tissues in an untargeted fashion. 
So I already uh, talked about uh, looking at bacteria using RINs and also talked about uh, using DASI uh, for uh, imaging tissue samples. So what we've done here is um, really uh, creating a, a large uh, bacterial uh, database and then trying to find taxon specific markers uh, in this uh, large spectral uh, library. We have uh, well over 100,000 uh, individual entries in this uh, spectral library. So it was uh, fairly easy to find the taxon specific markers uh, down to the um, level of um, gen individual genera. And then uh, we actually went back to our DASI datasets, pre-acquired DASI uh, datasets, and we were trying to find these uh, signals uh, in the uh, DASI uh, datasets. So practically imaging the uh, individual uh, phyla or genera uh, in these uh, human uh, tissue samples. So uh, this is a colorectal uh, adenocarcinoma uh, tissue and using uh, different uh, taxon specific markers, uh, uh, we could uh, go for different bacterial taxons and uh, visualize their uh, distribution. Uh, obviously, um, they are largely residing in the uh, necrotic areas, but you can actually see that uh, there is quite a bit of difference between the individual uh, distributions. So, uh, for instance, uh, there is this uh, highly uh, anaerobic uh, bit, so uh, it's really uh, uh, highly necrotic dissolving tissue and uh, uh, clostridia are really the, uh, the only ones who are uh, feeling all right uh, uh, in that area. So as I said, it works at different levels. Unfortunately, it doesn't work at species level, but uh, one can uh, certainly tell that this genus uh, bacteria and this genus uh, are uh, present uh, in this uh, spot. And the beauty of this is that it doesn't need any kind of reagent. It doesn't need any kind of antibody or DNA or RNA probe. Uh, these are what one needs uh, is the uh, database and uh, the individual markers identified uh, in the database. And the uh, last bit here is uh, really how to combine all of these uh, different components. So um, one application which we are actually um, testing uh, clinically uh, these days is uh, the eye endoscope, uh, which is the eye knife technology uh, in endoscopy. So we are uh, using it uh, for uh, colorectal uh, screening. The question here is whether there is a cancerous component in a colorectal polyp. So um, the good thing is that uh, these uh, snares, these colorectal snares are electrosurgical devices. So the only thing we have to do is just aspirate the electrosurgical smoke and uh, introduce it into the mass spectrometer and uh, identify uh, the, the issues. At the beginning, it, it looked uh, quite impossible because uh, the aerosol has to go through overall uh, like four to six meter long tubing. I mean, the entire endoscope and obviously the mass spectrometer is not next to the patient, but uh, farther away in the corner. But uh, surprisingly enough, uh, it worked without any additional um, technical tricks. So uh, this video shows the exact same thing. <clears throat> in vivo, so the snare is already around uh, the stalk of the uh, polyp, and uh, one can see as it turns uh, whitish uh, as the uh, current is uh, deployed, and uh, then the uh, signal pops up um, on the uh, screen. So, uh, with a couple of second delay, we can actually identify any kind of uh, cancerous component uh, in the stalk. So uh, we started actually this uh, trial a little bit more than a year ago. Unfortunately, it was slowed down quite a bit by COVID, but uh, it's, it's getting uh, back to uh, action. So well, hopefully by next year, uh, we will have the uh, first results. And another area which actually came out of uh, this uh, project was um, not only using the uh, reams uh, for um, in, in surgical robotic um, settings, <clears throat> but um, creating autonomous uh, surgical robotics uh, using the 
in situ uh, mass back uh, lipidomics, shotgun lipidomics. So, um, as most of you know, surgical robots uh, are not like uh, R2D2 uh, grabbing the surgical devices, uh, walking into the theater and operating on somebody, but they are really just the extended arms uh, of surgeons. So, uh, they eliminate the factors uh, associated with uh, the uh, surgical dexterity. Uh, they allow such, uh, mm, such level of invasiveness, uh, which otherwise would be impossible using the bare hands of the uh, surgeons. But uh, at the end of the day, the surgeon is actually controlling exactly what is happening. If it comes to autonomous surgical robotics, that's much more of the R2-D2 uh, type of uh, scenario. In that case, we actually tell the robot what to do, and then the surgeon may watch it, but the, surgeon, the, but the robot is actually doing it. So uh, in this case, um, it, it looks uh, quite uh, horrible, uh, like some alien sample, but uh, it is actually uh, a chicken liver, uh, a piece of chicken liver uh, embedded into a bigger piece of uh, calf liver. And uh, what the instrument uh, is doing, it is actually probing the tissue and uh, coming back with an identification. And based on that identification, it maps where the tissue to be removed is, and then goes around and, uh, and takes it on. So uh, this is the, uh, the long-term uh, future, but uh, it, it seems to work uh, quite well. Um, we are not there, obviously, yet to, uh, to test it on uh, human beings, but uh, certainly it is, uh, it, it is on the um, cards, so uh, we hope that in a few uh, years we can actually use this uh, shotgun uh, tissue lipidomics based approach to direct uh, surgical robots. And yeah, that was really my last uh, example. So as you can see, uh, the uh, uh, the perspectives uh, are. Um, limitless. So uh, we really hope that uh, all of these technologies uh, get uh, translated to uh, clinical practice and we will actually see uh, mass spectrometers uh, in uh, interventional environment as well as uh, at GP surgeries. Thank you very much.